Hey everybody, Red Mage here. Welcome back to this series where I go through different RPG products that I have and give them a quick flip through and review. In this one, I'm going to be going through three Shadow Dark adventures that were all developed for the recent Spooky Tales game jam that was put together by Dungeon Masterpiece, uh, Baron de Rob. These three are some of the best from that whole set. You know, I know that uh, I think he did a review or a, you know, a ranking on his channel. And uh, you can go to itch.io and find, I think there's, there's over 100 entries, and I've, I've downloaded them all. <laughs> I've gone through most of them in something like detail. I mean, 100 of them, I couldn't go through all of them in a lot of detail. But I basically sifted through and I found a lot that I really like. And so I think over the next few days, weeks, I might be going through some of them and giving you guys my thoughts on them. And uh, these are the first three that I wanted to cover. The Caught in the Snare of the Eternal Executioner, which is a level zero gauntlet adventure for Shadow Dark. Uh, a Very Merry Shadowween, which is a mini holiday hex crawl for low-level characters. I think this could also really work as a gauntlet. I'll talk about that more in a minute. And then The Caverns of Carnage, which is a, a more or less standard dungeon crawl, but I think it's a really good uh, example of a good dungeon from Shadow Dark and, and in the style of Shadow Dark, so that's why I wanted to pick this one. But let's go through um, Caught in the Snare of the Eternal Executioner. I think it's a fun one. So basically, um, each of these adventures <clears throat> excuse me, was supposed to be inspired by a cover from a pulp uh, magazine cover back in the day. And so all of them have sort of influences and stylistic choices from those uh, pulp magazine covers, and I think this is one of them. Um, now, the dungeon itself is pretty straightforward. The players start in room 1, and then they have to get through to room 14 with the right thing in order to get out of the dungeon. So there's a lot of exploration they can do. It's fairly well looped. You can, you know, you have a little loop um, from 1 to 9, 10, back 11 and 2, and then you can go to up to 12, down to 5 and 4. So there's a couple loops in this dungeon, which is nice. And there's a, uh, a few set of nice random encounters. Essentially, the way it works is the players are trapped in this old keep that has been basically the uh, uh, this horrific creature lives there and it can drain the life uh, of any creature that it touches or that it kills and takes them takes the remaining years that they might have for itself and so this place has been used as a as basically an execution site because anytime um, the people want to get rid of somebody they send them over to the sea bear keep a Seabury Keep, and uh, the Eternal Executioner rises, kills them, drains their life, and then goes back. And so the players are stuck here. But there's this prophecy uh, that this Eternal Worm will come, and uh, the, the Conqueror Worm will come and destroy the Eternal Executioner. And it's this giant purple worm, basically, and that's what happens. The adventure starts as this purple worm breaks in and starts to you know, ruin the keep. And the players happen to break out of their cells, and they got to get out. So it's a great um, timed adventure. It uses, it makes use of the Shadow Dark timer. It says you have two hours of real time to get out of the dungeon. So if you want to use that, that built into the timer system of Shadow Dark, I don't tend to do that. But this one has a good reason for the timer. Is this worm is slowly but surely breaking the keep, and it's going to devour the whole thing and shatter it. You got to get out. And the dungeon itself is quite fun because you're dealing with creatures that have been drained. It's a nice background for the adventure. Oh, as a note, one of the requirements for this adventure was that, uh, for this jam, was that every adventure be eight pages or fewer. So nothing's, nothing's longer than eight pages. These are all very short. And the other requirement, or the other allowance, was that AI art could be used. And so you'll see that in one of these adventures, at least, that there's AI art used. The other two don't use it. But the third one, the Caverns of Carnage, does. Um, so I just I think this is a great adventure. It's a it's a great little gauntlet, really. That's what you're looking at here. Um, allow the players to roll their starting equipment, let them know they won't have immediate access to it. So basically, everyone can make their their, their gauntlet characters, but you're going to start off with no equipment, and then you find it, and then as characters die, um, their replacements take their place, and they find their equipment basically, um, and you can move on and kind of keep the equipment of each character as you move forward. Um, it's kind of wealth by attrition. That's how DCC called it, right? I think that's what DCC called it. Um, you start off in the prison, and it breaks, and then you've got to try to get out. And it's the guard station, the strangled puppets, the last breath gallery, where this executioner has stored the last breaths of many of his victims, and so you can open them up and you hear the, the last breath, the sound they made as they died. And one of those is important. 
um, there's a ghost who made the prophecy about the worm in the first place, and uh, she knows more than the others, so you got to find it. Get in there. Cough caps. It's kind of cool. The ossuary of the dam with murders of crows. That's another thing is everybody that this executioner kills returns as a crow, and so there's tons of crows. Giant crows, swarms of crows, crows everywhere. So it's kind of a, a crow-themed dungeon. You find him, he's kind of a vampire, but he has this life drain or time drain sort of thing. Um, he doesn't have a bite, he has a great axe attack. Because he's an executioner, so he's got a big axe. You don't want to wake him up, but you kind of have to wake him up, unfortunately. There's a vacuum chamber. You can suffocate and a dead dwarf in there. And a lot of the stuff in here is good because it has usable stuff in the rest of the dungeon. So yeah, there's some treasure that's not going to be useful here. Um, but a lot of the stuff that you find is threats with also treats that are immediately useful. That's what I like in, in Gauntlets, where you have a reward that is immediately useful in the Gauntlet. I think a lot of players, a lot of DMs reward players with gold or treasure, and that's what a lot of players want. But in a Gauntlet, I think the goal should be to survive. The, the reward should be to survive. And the treasures and the rewards that you find can be pretty cool and awesome, don't get me wrong, but they should be useful in the Gauntlet. They should provide a way to survive, or help you survive a bit. And this dungeon does a pretty good job of that. Uh, the Dead Man's Well, the Door of Final Judgment, and then the Gallows, where um, you've got to get past it. And on top of the Gallows is a great sword that is really powerful. Um, and it's very useful against the, the evil guy who's going to be chasing you out if you can find it. Uh, then you have ending the adventure. What happens if you don't make it out before the timer runs out? And what happens if you do? If you just hang around or barricade yourself in somewhere or survive until the timer runs out, you can still survive, but it's a pretty hard dex check, and you're still going to lose some equipment as you escape. So it's 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 a it's a cost and a risk, and a lot of people are just going to die. So you want to try to get out of there if, if you possibly can. So that's the whole adventure. It's just eight pages beneath the Seabury Keep. Um, caught in the snare of the Eternal Executioner. But I think it's a great gauntlet. It's a great entry. Um, and it's a, it's a pay-what-you-want adventure. So if you're interested in running a very interesting, I think really fun gauntlet that gives you a good reason to, to all start together, to get out, and then to move into the world with a little bit of you know high fantasy tone. So, But otherwise, it's, it's pretty much any setting you want. I think that's great. Uh, and a lot of the gauntlets so far that I've seen for Shadow Dark have been very tonally specific in terms of like setting. Um, you know, there's, there's not a lot of kind of more generic setting gauntlets, and I think this one actually is. Uh, there are a few assumptions about the world, but if you don't like a giant purple worm, you can say it's an earthquake, right? That there's a, this earthquake that is that is threatening the keep, and that's what's actually happening. Um, and if you don't want it to be a vampire, maybe it's a ghost or something like that. You know, you can change uh, you can change the theming of the adventure a little bit to make it fit your setting more, if you want. So, Caught in the Snare of the Eternal Executioner by Jordan Thompson, a level zero gauntlet adventure for Shadow Dark RPG. Great. I would say this is definitely an A adventure. The next is A Very Merry Shadowween, which is a mini holiday hex crawl for low level characters. This is definitely a Halloween adventure, and it is so flavorful. This is an A. Plus. Out of the park, I think this one rocks, uh, rocks it. <laughs> it was just one of my favorites from the whole game jam. I like this quite a bit. The idea here is you are, there's this floating island, but it's floating on a bunch of arms and hands. So it's like just off the ground and it kind of like crawls over the land. It's really creepy. And it's the size of an irregular hex. You could put it in your world, but once every year it gets up and these hands lift up the island and they crawl over the landscape and they grab people and they like throw them up onto the island. And there's no way off, because if you try to climb off, there's this kind of choking fog that hurts you. But even if you get off, then the hands are just going to grab you and chase you and put you back on. And uh, so that's what's happened to the party, is that they start off having been grabbed and thrown onto this island on the one night of the year, probably Shadowween, right? Halloween, or the whatever night of the year has a sort of dark and spooky celebration for your, for your world. And the players don't know what's up. They're just stuck on this island. How are we going to get off? You know, if they have something like fly, obviously they can get off, but you don't want to you don't want to use it on characters who have that sort of level of ability. So that's why it's low level of characters. I think a gauntlet would be great. They're just peasants in their village. They're they're doing their thing, and this island crawls up over and grabs them and throws them on, and they're all suddenly here. I think it would be a great gauntlet. Level zero level uh, zero funnel. 
the levels are well. Um, starts off with the magic items and the monsters that you're going to be having for this adventure specifically, which is interesting. Usually those are in the back, but you get them right away. Uh, Reveler's Mask, with some benefits and some curse. The Melon of Mobility, which is a melon car you can find. Right? It's a giant pumpkin, um, or watermelons and gourds, which basically is the cover, right? It's a car that drives around and you can use it. Um, and then there's some new monsters, a veggie gremlin and a candy hag. you got to keep an eye on those things. So here's the background. Here's the objective and uh, what you're trying to do and the general environment of the island and the hags. And each hag is a different kind of hag and they all have different things they want to do. So Melina is the candy hag and she wants to turn her victims into candy. And she lives in Goblin Town, which is spelled like gobbling instead of goblins. Um, and then there is Mira, the sea hag, and she wants to turn her victims into frogs and she lives on the lake. And then there's Myrtle, the wheeled hag, and she lives in the manor, and she wants to turn her victims into trees. She paints them. It's great. And so the three of them basically have these victims, the things that they want to do, um, and uh, they all appear to be beautiful maidens. And so you got to try to kill them or collect their gems and put them in the skull sensor and then get out of here. Here's the hex. It, each of these hexes are sub-hexes, so they're two miles apart. So this would fit into a standard six-mile hex. Uh, which is great because again it's a floating island so it can literally cover if you're doing a hex crawl with your players it can literally cover the hexes on your map already you don't have to do anything additional you add it right in and it moves around but maybe it only moves around once a year and it rises up out of a misty um hazy maybe there's a hex a swamp hex or something in your map where this is normally at rest and players can't get to it or it's hard to get to but and once a year it moves across the landscape for the random encounters, and they're all pretty fun. And there's one random encounter that I think is great. It's the Brom Bones Gang. And this is sort of the fun, wild element of the adventure, because they're going around doing tricks and treats, and you roll randomly to see whether they're doing tricks or treats in the various places. And the tricks make things a lot harder for you, the treats make things a lot easier for you, and they're all scattered around. So I think that's great. Um, but not always, I guess it's not, it's not true that the tricks are always hard, make things always harder for you, but they do things make things more challenging or interesting and they, they change things up i guess the, the treats do too but they're usually helpful you start off in the whispering woods and you got to move around it's not just necessarily there's a mist and so it's not you can't always go directly to the hex you want to get to but you can do what you'd like to do and so then there's uh there's the manor house which is uh, myrtle's lair there's the goblin town which is melina's lair and i think they're great the the one myrtle's lair is this giant spooky house Right? You could add in a whole dungeon there if you wanted. You could make this a one-shot for a Halloween adventure. You could make this a several session adventure campaign. Um, whatever you want to do. It's, 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 you could actually expand this quite a bit. There are opportunities to make more dungeons on this, on this six mile hex. And Myrtle's Lair would be one of them. There's a brief descri description of what the place is like and what's there. And I think it's really well done. There's an efficiency in language here, which I really like. Um, and the bullet points, the bolding, it's very easy to read what's in each location. It's very, very evocative and whimsical and kind of spooky and funny. I like it a lot. Goblin Town, very much everyone's wearing masks. They're all actually candy golems, but you don't know that. They all have costumes and masks that cover them completely, and you can't see them at all. And so uh, there's activities you can do, like apple bobbing, broomstick tossing. You can eat sweets, but if you do, you get lured, you get enchanted by Melina, and you get kind of drawn to the patisserie where she's making candy, and she wants to make you into candy. And then you're trying to find the gem, so there's this whole thing. Now, how you how you would discover what is actually going on, that would be part of the adventure. So, you know, you're going to be moving around trying to figure out what to do, and eventually you're going to find out about the gems. But you're not going to immediately find out what the gems are and what they're useful for. You might find the gem and go, oh, interesting, I have a gem. And then there's this one person in town who's intelligent and willing to talk. Everyone else is just only going to talk about the party and all that stuff. Maybe I should ask her about the gem. And if you do, then she's very unhappy because uh, it's her missing gem. Uh, or you can talk to the Brom Bones gang and maybe they can tell you what's going on. You know, so there's, there's different things you could do. There's the gazebo of woe. <laughs> there is the fruited fields. And there's the sad hill boneyard where you have a, a, a mausoleum and some kids telling ghost stories and you have to tell a ghost story to the kids. If you do, they help you out. But then the, whatever you told, whatever, whatever kind of ghost story or monster story you told them, comes to life. That's really cool, and you're supposed to use stats that make sense for whatever the players have told. I think that's awesome. 
really, really cool. It's the next random encounter of the story that they told comes to life and attacks them. <laughs> That's such a cool idea. Uh, and then there's a devil trapped in the mausoleum who can help out if you free him, if you want to make a deal with him. And then there's the riveting lake, which is where uh, Mira is. And then these are the, the covers that inspired the uh, particular adventure, as well as uh, influences from Ravenloft and most particularly Over the Garden Wall, which I love. And I think you can absolutely see the influence from Over the Garden Wall, especially in Goblin Town. There's a bunch of pumpkin-headed people celebrating a harvest festival sort of thing, <laughs> which is, I think, the first episode, maybe the second episode. Yeah, I think it's the second episode of Over the Garden Wall. So this is a great one. A+, plus, absolutely, in flavor, in tone, and execution. I'm going to run this. For Halloween, I'm going to run this for my nieces, or my, my nephews at least. Maybe not my nieces. They might not enjoy it so much, but my nephews at least. I uh, might run it for my regular group. I mean, this is just a great, great Shadow Dark adventure. And I think I would run it as a gauntlet. I think it's the sort of monsters you're going to be facing are low enough level that, and there aren't that many of them, that an encounter with them is probably not going to do much against a leveled party. But against uh, level zero characters, peasants and stuff, I might just use like the DCC uh, tables for level zero characters instead of the um, Shadow Dark ones. You just have peasants going up against skeletons or going up against a ghost or a, a you know a hag. That would be much more interesting, I think. And it fits sort of the uh, ordinary people putting on costumes for Halloween thing instead of adventurers. Anyway, I think this is great. Highly recommend you guys check this out. Finally, I'm going to look at the Caverns of Carnage, which is the most, I would say, standard of these uh, of these adventures. It's, it's influenced by this one cover from Weird Tales, which I think is a really cool cover. Um, Black Bagila, and uh, it's basically a jungle temple where there are these two factions, beast men and cultists, who are fighting, and then a giant panther has gotten in, sort of ghost panther, this avatar, this old god princess sort of thing, and it's just devouring people. And so it's sort of these two factions, but also then there's this force, almost a force of nature, just destroying everything, and, and uh, you got to figure out what to do. It's it's actually kind of good. You can help it. But it's certainly going to fight you if you're if you're not careful, and it's going to fight the beast men and the cultists too. But the layout of the dungeon is great. It's there's a, a little linearity to it. There are some choices about how to approach different locations. Um, there's a little bit of flexibility there. You really are entering in one area. There's a couple exits, of, or three exits, three ways of getting out of this place. Um, and you're coming here probably for treasure. There's an overview factions here and they're actually factions i like that about it there actually are groups that are faced off and that you could probably interact with to some degree uh, if you speak uh, i forget the language of the beastmen but if you speak the language of the beastmen uh, um, in uh, shadow dark then you might be able to actually interact with them and certainly you're going to be able to interact with the cultists and nadala actually uh, who is the uh the avatar the black death the uh, black panther who's coming around and eating people and now you're here, <laughs> the treasure hunters. The rumors are not my favorite kind of rumors. Many of them are just like, hey, this place has treasure. It's like, yeah, we, we know that. That's why we're here. But um, you could maybe use this as a way of, if you're playing this as part of a bigger adventure or part of a bigger campaign and the players are in a jungle location and then there's a nearby you know, ruin that has rumors about it, you could use these sorts of rumors in that way. But I, I, I don't like many of them. Like they're, you know, there are things that you're going to either run across. For example, I'll give you one. Um, the number four is, you wouldn't believe me, but I heard there's a hidden library deep in the temple packed with scrolls older than any book in the king's library. Think of the secrets you could uncover. I would like that if the library were hidden behind secret doors, right? Because then the players would be like, didn't we have that rumor about there being a secret library here? Maybe we should look around for it. But the fact is, the, if you look at the map um, early on, the library is room seven, and it's not hidden at all. Right? It's in fact right out in the open. You can walk, you can just walk to it through open doors that aren't locked and aren't there's no secrets. So they're gonna find it probably if they're just looking around um, without it being like a thing they have to even remember or, or learn about. Um, so I I really wouldn't um, yeah I really wouldn't uh, <laughs> really wouldn't uh, do these sorts of rumors. I think rumors that are gameable are much more fun. Um, so, yeah, anyway, these are good, like, hooks to get the players interested in going if it's a part of an adventure. Uh, again, if, like, they don't have a choice about coming here. But if you're running this as a one-shot, then these are all going to be it's pretty much useless because they're already going to be here. Um, Grimhaven itself and uh, the um, 
the Black Thorn Covenant, the stats of the Beastmen, what they're doing here, and, and the chances of running into them, and what they're like, and what you can get from them. Random encounters here, um, and how often you're going to do it. It's an unsafe location. Check every three crawling rounds. And you have a description of each place, and the layout is very, very good. It's very clear. Um, it's um, standard, I would say, Shadow Dark formatting. Now, as you'll see as we go through, the, the uh, art is AI art, but I actually think it's not done badly. Um, you know, for a last minute free, um, or not a last minute, but a, a game jam, I should say, uh, pay what you want, eight page PDF. I don't mind AI art so much. Um, it's not my favorite. And again, this execution of it is, is, is better than I think a lot of others. Um, it's more incidental. There is one piece towards the end, but I think it's actually fairly well done. It looks good. Um, so you have the holding cells, the sacristy, the pit, the sacrifice, the library. There's a couple bits of weirdness, like <laughs> two rooms away, there are two different sacrifices happening. Cultists are killing beastmen, and in the other room, beastmen are eating cultists, and they're like one, like they're just like 20 feet down the hall. <laughs> You're like, why? I mean, I get it. Like, you know, these are two groups that are fighting, and uh, they don't necessarily want to just go and fight each other again. They've just been fighting, and they've, you know, gotten away with several members of each group, but. It's just always weird to have factions like 20 feet away, um, just like chilling, hanging out. I've always thought that was weird in any dungeon. That's not specific to this one, but you, it also happens here. Um, but again, there's enough opportunity for interaction. You're probably going to be able to do that. I, I like that. Um, there are some cultists that are more willing to talk than others. They have names, whereas the others don't. And then you get the hollow itself, which is the twisting maze of deadly caverns below the place. This is where the beastmen live. So the, the cultists have been up in the temple, the beastmen have been down here, and there are lots of them. Um, and there's an aboleth in the pond that's controlling the beastmen, which is pretty tough. Uh, you've got to be really, really careful if you're gonna if you're gonna run through and fight an aboleth. So suddenly there's an aboleth down there. But it's kind of cool that suddenly there's this darker thing that's actually controlling the beastmen. Maybe the beastmen aren't so happy about that. Right? Maybe some of them have managed to break free of it, and you could turn them against it. There, there are things you could do here to uh, to make it a bit more engaged. Or maybe you could use Nadala against the, this, because of course Nadala used to live here, this, or this was her this was her place. Um, maybe you could find a way of getting her to help you. And here is what you're supposed to read. You're supposed to show the players this piece of art and read this um, and read this. Uh, text once once you help her or if you get the vision of the panther and um it's a really good one i actually think when it comes to ai like you can tell it's ai art but it's actually done well and it, it kind of has a, a cool vibe I, I like it i think it fits with the overall tone of the adventure and uh and the, the the writing here is nice i like it it's 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 really well done you get an appendix for magic items and the new monsters a blood ooze a swarm of animated books and the doll of the black death um black panther not that hard Two attacks at rend in one bite, which is quite a lot, but no special defenses or anything like that. AC 15 and 29 hit points, so fairly hard to kill. But the hard thing is, once you kill Nadala, she just comes right back after a while. Next time you encounter her, she's back at full hit points because she's just an avatar and fades into the ethereal realm. So she's not actually there. Ceremonial incense, a porter's tunic, and the potion of quickness are the special magic items that you get for this adventure. So again, I think Captain of Carnage is a very well done dungeon crawl. I think it's tonally very consistent, and I like the use, you know, the, I would prefer maybe more public domain art, like more like those weird tale art, uh, weird tales art that is used right here at the, at the introduction. I think that would be better than the AI art, but absent that, I think the execution of the AI art is well done. It's better than a lot of the, the stuff I've seen <laughs> out there. Um, and again, the fact that it's a free or pay what you want game jam product makes me not mind that so much but i think it's a great one um, definitely a, a solid i would say b plus a minus um and uh, a really good execution of the uh of the dungeon crawl formatting but i think again the, this one's great but the very merry shadowween is so good it's just top of the line <laughs> really one of the best adventures out there and caught in the snare of the eternal executioner is a really fun gauntlet too i think that would be fun to run i'm trying to run it at some point all right, guys. Well, I hope this has been interesting to everybody. I'll put links below to where you can get them all. Um, and I'll hope to see you guys in another video.